Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we're in our third and final night of pre-conference keynotes for the Homeschool Plus Conference. Uh, Matt Hearn is here. Matt, you and I have tried to connect for so long. I'm so delighted you're here. Thanks. Uh, I want to say and thanks for having me, but then um, I asked Nick, thanks for hosting me something. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, anyway, I'm glad you're here. Don't miss our Alternative Education Film Festival, which is taking place right now. We have seven films uh, and interviews with the directors. Most of the directors have made the, the videos free online or close to free. Uh, go to altedfilmfest.com or virtualfilmfestival.com. A lot of fun. And if you're kind of tracking this, uh, after the Alternative Education Film Festival, we're going to do one on foods uh, in October. Uh, and we've got uh, plenty more planned. So. Stay tuned. Thanks to our promotional sponsors for the conference, Homeschool Life, G3, and Home Education Magazine. They help us to get the word out, and we appreciate it. And thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for this platform. It's a terrific platform. So we have a small audience tonight. But those of you who are here, if you can let us know where you're participating from, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Or you can click on the star to the left of the map and then click it twice and then click on the map. Lynn's in Yakima. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. And our others are too shy. Oh, there's go, there goes one. Feel free to, to post in the chat. It is a way to participate. I'll kind of track questions for Matt as we go along or comments. Uh, he, he may find that he's able to multitask and see them as well while he's talking. If, Matt, if you feel like that's uh, distracting you, don't worry. I'll watch it and I can um, make anything known that needs to be known or, or gather questions for uh, toward the end. Okay, we're going to move on, and uh, Matt, I'm going to turn the time over to you. Uh, I loved your description of this event. Uh, thanks for being here. Right. Thanks for having me, Mike, and uh, thanks to uh, you folks who are here. Um, I have to say, I can you uh, does, that, does that sound all right, by the way, for you, uh, Steve? Or can you no, it's, it's not perfect, but it is audible, so you're doing a good job. Okay. Okay. Very well. I think good job might be pushing it. This is uh, extending the uh, the limits of my technological capacity, I would say, fairly thoroughly. So I had uh, two young people here uh, walk me through the process. So, uh, but that said, it looks kind of slick, and I think it's kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting platform. So, so cool. Let's let's give it a shot and see how this goes, you guys. Um. So uh, the first thing for you is that I live uh, in East Vancouver, British Columbia. That Massachusetts. And, um, it's important to acknowledge when I'm over here that I'm talking to you from the traditional and the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. So thanks for uh, for having me here and you all there. So it's been a while since I've uh, spoken to a to a, a homeschooling or an unschooling or a deschooling audience, or, um, and I've I've spent I spent almost a decade and a half, I guess. Uh, touring around, talking to a lot of alternative schools, talking to homeschooling groups, uh, talking to all kinds of policymakers about education, but I haven't done it for, so, for a little while for a number of reasons. And part of that, I think, is that I've had a pretty contentious relationship um, with the homeschooling, the unschooling, the deschooling, alternative education community over the years. Um, in many ways, I'm a giant supporter. I've, uh, I started a couple of democratic schools. Um, I unschooled my kids, started a, uh, a democratically run youth center here called the Purple Thistle that's been running for a long time. So in many ways, I've been a giant supporter of uh, alternative education, homeschooling, homeschooling, all that. Um, in, other hand, in lots of other ways, I found uh, my relationship with that with that movement and with many of those folks to be kind of disappointing in my opinion. Um, I find that many times, uh, the homeschooling and school movement to be particularly individualistic, to be uh, to be self-absorbed, uh, and to be pretty blithely and smugly um, unapologetic about concretizing privilege. Um, I was sitting at a giving a lecture at a school some time ago, 
uh, a school that I will leave on name for now. Um, cool place. Actually, more than cool place. Amazing place. Wonderful place. Um, as good a school as you could ever hope to imagine. Thoughtful, progressive, interesting, good, kind people. Um, just such a sweet place. I, I can't imagine a better place for a kid to spend time in lots of ways. Um, $38,000 a year. And uh, and my argument to them uh, at that time, not surprising they haven't been invited back, but my argument at that time was that if you're charging $38,000 a year for a wonderful, wonderful opportunity that's available only to the most privileged people possibly in world history, that is actually a regressive thing. That is not a progressive initiative. You are actually doing much more damage than you are doing benefit to the world, in my opinion. Um, I think that a lot about the alternative schooling movement. The, the alternative schooling movement's relationship to privilege, I think, is really suspect and, uh, and not nearly willing to be uh, self-examining enough. Um, and so, so I think that I think that my argument then has been that, that I do think that, that homeschooling, that unschoolers can be a, a force for real social good. That people who think about learning uh, and education and, and childhood radically. Um, can also think about about the rest of the world in radical, progressive ways as well. Um, and I'm not talking just about the successes that homeschoolers have in producing one more app or one more kind of new enterprise or one more unschooler who gets richer, one more person who drops out of high school and turns into a CEO of a corporation. But I'm talking about somebody that can really invest. I'm talking about people who can really invest in the common good. They can really think beyond themselves, um, and, and is really engaged with. with there's something beyond there and their families flourishing. And so I think that's, that's and I feel like a bit of a, uh, a third in the punch bowl of the party here, and I apologize for that. Uh, but I think it's worth saying. Um, and I think that I guess part of my thinking here is that it's worth being, it's worth being very frank about the, the condition of the world currently. That we're facing unparalleled changes, uh, challenges. Um, Massive inequality, climate change, biodiversity loss, loss of indigenous land and languages, um, endemic poverty, one in seven people are going to go to bed hungry tonight. Um, and I, I don't think it's, it's worth being alarmist about what we're facing in terms of climate change or ecological catastrophe. It's not really my style. But I think it's worthwhile being, being real about what we're talking about here. A series of potentially unparalleled challenges to humanity, um, and I think that that. Well, let me tell you a story that I, I'm going to steal this story from a guy called Paul Watson. This is the Sea Shepherd Society, but it's a, a good metaphor in lots of ways. That uh, imagine the Earth, or imagine humanity as a spaceship zipping around the Earth, um, and zipping around the uh, the universe, and uh, captain sitting up on the bridge there and, and and all of a sudden somebody that comes running out and says, says to her, Hey listen, I got a I got this great idea. I pulled a bolt um out of the out of the hull of the ship here. Um, it's just a single bolt, but it's, it's really valuable. Um let's you know if we pull over the next at the next stop, the next harbor, let's uh let's, let's sell this bolt with a lot of money. So the captain she could say and thinks about it. Oh, okay. It's one it's one bolt there's there's thousands and millions and millions of bolts. It's a giant ship, you know, the entire giant spaceship, the entire humanity is on this thing. Um, that's one bolt. The entire thing's held together by millions and millions of pieces and pieces of metal and interconnected infrastructure. One bolt. Let's pull it over and sell it. So they do. They pull over and sell the bolt. It's great. It's fantastic. It gives them a whole lot of money. They think, oh, fantastic. They get back to the spaceship. It's like, travel around the university. Um, and then, uh, you know, so. The same person who's back to us is look, I put a couple more on I swear we can make a we can make a tremendous amount of money off it. Um let's keep doing this. She's like, it's true. Make a lot of money off it. Like, so they pull over the next harbor and sell those bolts. And then a couple more people get the idea and they pull a few out and then it starts becoming popular and all kinds of people start pulling bolts out of the out of the hull of the ship and the rear of the ship and the, the underside and all kinds of stuff. And because it's such a giant ship, it it doesn't matter. There's 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 thousands and millions and millions of bolts left over, and nothing's fine. And, and what Watson says is that eventually, you get the metaphor, is that eventually someone's going to pull out the wrong bolt. 
it's going to be too many bolts taken out, and the round is going to come off, and, and the hull is going to go flying off, and, and then it's going to be it's going to be game on. And that, of course, is the metaphor we're using for for ecological damages. But we keep pulling pieces out of the ecological integrity of of of, of the earth, and then see the matter. You know, with the watershed here, with the with the mountain there, with the with the lake here, a river there, a bit of atmosphere there, we just keep pulling on, we just keep pulling pieces out, and everything seems to be doing okay. I mean, yeah, there's things that are like, yeah, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, but eventually, we're going to pull one thing out, and, and who knows what that one is? But nobody knows what that that one bolt is. Um, so in that light, and and again, I'm not I'm not really an alarmist dude. I tend to be a pretty positive person about about the future in many ways, but I think that that the place I've come to work, I guess, for, for the last decade or so, of my kind of working life, is to start thinking and challenging almost everything that we know about classical or, or, uh, or neoclassical economic thinking. Um, and that, and that the basic, the basic piece that I've come to is that, uh, in particular, since uh, World War II, there's been an endemic, uh, an endemic belief that's popularized incredibly widely that suggests that we're doing great. And the reason that we're doing great is that we've left professional economists uh, in charge of things. That just sit back, let the experts, let the professionals deal with things, and yet that we are constantly facing cyclical crises of capitalism. That of course there's, you know, there's, there's a crisis that will come, a financial crisis there, uh, an oil shock crisis here. But just sit back and let the professionals handle things. And and I have come to believe, um, not unlike my beliefs about about contemporary state schooling and about uh, compulsory education, is that that is exactly the wrong approach. And in fact, what we need is a groundswell of popular participation, not just in in, in in economic thinking, but in almost every area of life. I've come to believe uh, that I've been thinking about education and about learning and about schooling is that is that the more that we sit back and think that we should just let the experts handle uh, the way our children are brought up and the way that we believe that knowledge should be gained, that epistemology is something that should be beyond uh, all of us. I, I think the more wrong that the more wrong we are. I think that, that the idea of raising children, the idea of education, the idea of learning has to be a, a, a popular one. The one has to be that, that all of us have to be having conversations constantly about what it means to, to grow up right. I think similarly about that about about economics is that each of us and all of us have to be constantly thinking and participating in real economic debates and real political organizing about what we mean when we talk about value. Because that's really what economics are, is about how we impute value, how we count what matters. And historically, to my mind anyways, the, the home on outschooling world has been so good, so so articulate, so brave about being willing to ask fundamental questions about learning and what it means to grow up right, that, uh, and so good at asking fundamental questions. I would really like to see that that act and that capacity and that energy turn to a broader sphere beyond just what is good for us and our families. Um, uh, to start thinking about better social goals. Um, and so let me ask, let me offer to you just a, a couple of a couple of quick starting points um, that I that I'll suggest for you. The first one uh, around this, and, and this is really, I think it's, I'm going to talk about economics a little bit, but I I, I hope you grab this other. Uh, other fields as well, which is that to, to note that the idea of economics is socially constructed. That there is that oftentimes people speak about economics, they talk about about laws and about principles as if they are laws of physics like gravity, and, and that's that's simply untrue. That economics is, is entirely socially constructed. Uh, there is no such thing, for example, as a free market. So my screen just went all blank. I don't know if anything came through. Oh, but um, and that um, and, and that those are those are ideas that have been made up that have been constructed, just like ideas about schooling and about education have been constructed. They've been they're the product of human conversation. They're the idea of human political goals. They're the idea the product of, of of social construction. And I think that, that when we think about economics, when we think about what we value and what matters to us, we have to understand that. And every time that that people, if you hear something about the world of economics that you think is weird or, or you don't understand or you think doesn't make sense, you're, you're probably right. It probably is absurd. It probably is uh, preposterous. Um, and then virtually every fundamental uh, assumption about, about economics needs to be challenged. Um, one of the ones that I think that we might point to is, is to talk about, for example, about the, the GDP. 
um, the GDP is emerged since the Second World War is the fundamental uh, measurement of economic well-being at a national level. And it's a purely human invention. Um, it adds a number of things together, but it adds consumer expenditure, it adds government expenditure, it adds uh, corporate or, or the private sector investment, and it, and it adds net exports. Um, that's what it does. It counts up the expenditures of, of the economy. And it has is, is emerged uh, over the last 60 years as the fundamental evaluatory mechanism by which we measure whether or not a country, a city, a region is doing well or not. Um, and what we measure is is, is what we place behind it. Um, an interesting thing about the GDP um, as a way to measure what counts is that it, it only adds, it doesn't subtract. So some time ago, um, uh, well, a whole, since, since, since its inception, since some business invented the GDP in the, in the late 1930s, all kinds of people have been coming up with alternative measures. But one of the measures is a, is a green GDP, which simply takes ecological destruction and minuses it from the GDP. It's a good idea. Um, and, and only one country in the world has ever attempted to implement it, and that was China in 2003. And the results were so catastrophic when they started measuring uh, actual green uh, GDP. Is that, is that many uh, uh, districts registered, many provinces registered negative growth, opposed to positive growth. The Chinese central government immediately abandoned it because the, the results were so were so compellingly uh, awful. Um, but but when we talk about what matters, we're, we're constantly adding. When we're talking about the, about a new uh, a new development, a new mine, a new proposal, a new transportation infrastructure, we're constantly adding, but we're rarely subtracting. We almost never subtract. We don't have the capacity to do that. So we end up with this absurd situation where, for example, uh, after this talk, the, the worst thing, if you're, if you're not at home, if you're somewhere else, the worst thing that you could do right now, uh, economically speaking, would be to walk. That would do very little for the economy. The only thing that's really the thing economic that you would be doing is to um, maybe a little bit of depreciation on your shoes. The second worst thing you could do for the economy would be to uh, ride your bike. That too would be a very little help. The better thing for you to do after this would be to, to ride your bike. I'm sorry, to drive your car. If you could drive your car home after we finish talking here, that would actually add a significant number of economic transactions um, uh, and would contribute to the general economic welfare of your region to some regard. But much better than all of that, the very best thing you could do for the economy right now would be to get your car and have an accident. Um, that sounds absurd, um, but of course, there, if you get an accident, there's a huge number of economic transactions that take place immediately. Um, you have, uh, you have police that show up, firefighters make the ambulance people show up. Uh, soon there will be a call to the insurance. Soon there will be a call to the body shop. You'll have to get your car towed away. You might have to go to the hospital. Then there will be all kinds of insurance and actu actuarial uh, adjustments that have to be made. Um, and there will be a whole set of uh, repercussions from that as well. You might have to take a taxi home. You might have to rent a car. And all of those things contribute to the economy. And so in, in economic terms, thinking about a car crash isn't good it makes a lot of sense. In every other sense, that sounds insane. Uh, well, why, why would anybody want to have a car crash, and how could any car crash be considered a good idea or beneficial in any sense? Um, and, and to extrapolate that to a, uh, to a larger sense, um, uh, after the Deepwater Horizon um, a catastrophe, um, actually there was a, 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 an overall uh, net GDP gain. And, and that's 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 can be extrapolated throughout the general economy, um, is that is the things that we know, that we know in our heart and we know with our eyes and our ears and our mouths are bad, things that like the Deepwater Horizon disaster, this is a disaster, except that on, on ledgers it measures as a, as a net positive. This happens over and over and over again, this constant miscounting and discounting throughout our economy and in, in our incapacity of, to measure about what matters to us. And, and given that this is a, a schooling or an educational forum, I think we can we can equate that in many ways to our incapacity to measure what really matters to us in terms of our children. Uh, we know that, that high stakes testing, in fact, the testing and examinations in general measure a whole bunch of things, but oftentimes the wrong things. And that we are that our evaluatory capacities in terms of traditional schooling measure exactly the wrong things. And as soon as you start measuring things, you begin to value. Um, and I think that just as as, as unschoolers and school resistors of all kinds have made really articulate, really thoughtful critiques of, of our evaluatory criteria of our children and how we measure um, and how we measure whether or not our children are doing well, I think that we need to extrapolate that further into general economics.
we need better ways of uh, we need better ways of, of, of counting what matters to us. Um, and along with that, I would say similarly is that um, is that ideologies, economic ideologies, and these are very tied and these are tied in many ways, I would say, to to compulsory schooling. Uh, ideologies of growth, um, we need to be we need to challenge them relentlessly. That we in fact do not need more economic growth. That people in this world do not go hungry because there's not enough food. Uh, people do not go to bed homeless tonight because there are not enough houses. Um, and people are not poor because there's not enough money in the world. Um, and that but I think gets us back to one of the great lies of late capitalism, which is the lie of scarcity. Uh, the idea that that there's not enough to go around and that somehow that we have to add to the pile because there's not enough. And this is this is a a, a very fundamental lie of capitalism. Um, that there is enough in it. That we live in a world of abundance. Problems are around inequality and around accumulation and around distribution, but they're not in terms of they're not problems. We do not live in an era of scarcity. We live in an era of abundance. Um, and I think that that same philosophy uh, is exemplified in many ways by the school system. Uh, in which education, to quote uh, a friend of Ivan Illich, um, is perceived as a as a scarce resource that has to be parceled out by professionals who apply apply particular kinds of treatments. Um, and that's not true. We know that we live in a world full of abundance, um, and that there is eminent capacity for everybody to learn what they need to learn, and for people to thrive. Um, education, learning, uh, is not a scarce resource that has to be parceled out. But I think. If we're talking about education or if we're talking about economics, that if I can return to one of my earlier themes, is what we need is, is a broad base of political participation. We need to inculcate new kinds of thinking that move us beyond uh, uh, predatory capitalism and compulsory schooling. We need new ways of thinking. We need new educational ways of thinking. We need new, yeah, we need new ways to think culturally, socially, economically. Um, and, and I think that the only way that we're going to be able to have those kind of broad-based, popular conversations uh, in every home, in every neighborhood, in every community, and all, and 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 and, and in every form possible, is if, that if we take that upon ourselves and our families and our neighbors, uh, and presume like, presume ourselves to be capable of having those kind of conversations, entrenched economic quandaries, uh, ideas about reimagining a, a, a schooling system cannot be left expert to such. It cannot be left to rationalist, modernist uh, bureaucracy. Those are conversations and those are changes and those are initiatives and those are ideas that have to come from us. If not us, then, then who? Um, and I think that we could loosely say the code calling word is that, is that we do not need mass answers. Uh, what we need is a mass of answers. Um, and we need to be nurturing at, at every level um, and every way we can pick up. And I think that from my perspective, I think we could take heart, and I presume that you can as well, from just the sheer number of places that I've visited around the world, and I'm and guessing you have as well, and the constantly amazing, relentless curiosity, resilience, and, and, and creativity of people that I keep running into in all kinds of places in all kinds of ways. And in, and in many ways, I would describe that as, as that we need to, to uh, aggressively reimagine ideas of entrepreneurialism. Um, and I've, I've, I think that entrepreneurialism has been, over the last 30 or 40 years in a neoliberal moment, has been captured by the political right. And so that entrepreneurialism tends to be synonymous with ideas of, of personal accumulation, of, of, of giant kind of uh, uh, schools of thought that, that reify ideas of, of capital accumulation and selfishness and greed and avarice as, as, somehow, as somehow virtuous. Um, but I think there's a way to... To think about entrepreneurialism is actually as a, as a common good. Think about entrepreneurialism in terms in in, uh, in the service of, of, of social benefit. Um, and I think that, that that much of that 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 idea of entrepreneurialism, I think that is that it gives me actually so much hope when I start thinking about an unschooling movement. Is that, that, that so much so many homeschools, so many unschools, so many alternative schools are simply the product of people saying, well, if we're not if, if if it's not up to us. If, you know, if we don't do it better, who's going to do it? It has to be up to us. And that all kinds of people from all kinds of walks of life, with all kinds of predilections and all kinds of confidence, are able to, to create something better in their homes, in their neighborhoods, just simply by, by existing and by taking it on and, and being courageous. 
I, and I think that that's exactly the kind of, uh, of entrepreneurialism I'm, I'm interested in. An entrepreneurialism that doesn't reduce itself to a DIY ethic, to a do-it-yourself ethic, but to a DIT ethic, to a do-it-together do do ethic that is driven by a kind of entrepreneurial, a kind of relentless and restless entrepreneurial spirit uh, and a commitment to the local economy. Um, and so I often use the end with the, the quote from Cornell West. It says that uh, you know, looking around, it would be it would be crazy to be to be optimistic. Looking around the world right now, there's very little reason to be optimistic about humanity's capacity to come up with creative solutions. Uh, you'd have to be somewhat blind and somewhat uh, wearing those eye glasses to, to, to think that we should be. Um, we have any particular reason to be optimistic. But what we do have, I think, is plenty of reason to be hopeful. And those are very different categories. Hope is a participatory category. Optimism is a spectatorial capacity. And I think that if we were to imagine hopefulness as participatory, and to think about the capacity to reimagine compulsory schooling, and to reimagine the predatory capitalist economies that we live in, I then think that, that homeschoolers and unschoolers and deschoolers and alternative schoolers are actually in many ways temperamentally and experientially ideally placed to take on some of these challenges because you and we, we've had those experiences. We've had those experiences of taking on challenges that seem untenable, that seem impossible, that seem too large for, for everyday people like us to take on, and yet we, we've taken them on in large respect because of the love of our kids, because we care about our kids so much, and it sucks so much to see our kids unhappy. So we've taken on We've taken on something else. We've taken on another idea. We've taken on the idea of creating schools and of creating alternatives to school in all kinds of ways that it might not have seemed like a good idea or even a plausible idea. And I would just ask and suggest and, and hope that all of us can extrapolate that kind of energy, that kind of enthusiasm, and that kind of hopefulness to a larger commonality uh, and not just be reduced to such a cool idea and such a such a powerful idea is homeschooling and unschooling to, to simply getting, getting what we can for us and our families. Um, and I, I remain very hopeful that the, the home and the unschooling movement uh, actually has the seeds of something much more profound. I think that's what I got to say. Okay. I, I'm the other one who's really commenting. Lynn made a comment, but I, I'm the other one really commenting here. But I'm really interested in this because it feels like there's a catch-22 involved. Right, which is we've accepted this model of uh, industrial economic uh, transmission of information or education, which um, doesn't promote um, critical thinking or a willingness to, to look at things holistically. And so it's kind of a trap, right? I mean, we, we seem to be going further and further down the rabbit hole of not being able to actually look at things carefully. And I put a note in the chat. I, nobody responded. I don't think most people know, but uh, the anti-propaganda laws that were on the books for, for decades were rescinded through NDAA. And, and even now it feels as though uh, we're having a hard time actually looking at what's taking place from a governance standpoint and saying uh, it's not okay that our own government would misrepresent to us for the purposes of accomplishing a goal. Um, Am I close to what you're describing? Uh, so I'm just all of a sudden I just figured out how to read the chat here. There we go. Um, I do think in a lot of ways, and I I think that that well, one of the things that I that I would argue is that we take almost the entire bulk of our children, force them through a compulsory education system, where through 12 years of of their childhood uh, in, in institutions where they have almost no capacity to make decisions for themselves. Uh, kids are, are told what to do, when to do, how to do it, and what sequence to do it. They have to ask to go to the bathroom. They have to eat their lunches at particular places, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we throw them out after 12 years and then suggest that they can become um, uh, capable, responsible citizens, uh, able to, to think for themselves and to be able to work and uh, uh, in a social milieu collaboratively and, 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 and creatively. I think that's a tremendous burden to place on our kids to actually to ask them to be democratic citizens having had no capacity to do that, uh, having no opportunity to do that through the vast bulk of their childhood. Um, and so what I do think is that, 
is that, that there's a relationship between school and larger societies for sure. Is that is that schools reflect what the the real world looks like as teachers are relentlessly telling kids. But schools also construct the real world. Um, and that and that if you are interested in a in a a very marginal democratic society, I think that we have the, the schools that we're looking for. So but part of what I heard you say as well was that, that, that Illich is really relevant here, right? That, that the schooling and even some of the motivations for often for homeschooling and unschooling are reflective of a larger culture which needs to be questioned rather than individual topics. I think that's I think that's very true in that way. I think that what we're asking here is that is that we can uh, by rethinking schools, by rethinking education, by rethinking epistemology, by challenging all of it, I think that we actually are laying the seeds for thinking about a different kind of world. Um, but that has to be done consciously, not just, well, that school's kind of an ugly place, let me try to get what's best for me and my kids and get out of here. Um, and I think that that involves a very conscious and a, or it has to involve a very conscious and a very consistent analysis of privilege, which is to say, who is able to do this and who is able to do this why, um, and who is benefiting from these movements. In fact. Um, and I think that oftentimes, I mean, the argument, uh, the kind of dominant argument for compulsory schooling, is that that's the only way, and that's been the argument from really good people, like from the very beginning of national schooling. In the late 1700s, from people like Mary Wollstonecraft, um, is that the argument is that is that if we're actually interested in a, in a democratic meritocratic society, whereby people get ahead uh, or you know achieve a certain goals based on merit, that that we have to force everybody into contemporary into compulsory schooling. Otherwise, we were we're going to constantly have the entrenchment of privilege through generations, and people were will become privileged, will become rich through through no. Um, through no, through no virtue of their own, through no work of their own. Um, and I think in lots of ways that homeschooling is at its worst, but it doesn't challenge that. I think homeschooling is at its best is when it's actually trying to undermine uh, privilege and increase uh, the capacity of people to self-determine their lives. But when that's, that's extrapolated beyond just let me get mine uh, and screw everybody else. But we have to think about that, 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 that analysis and that kind of courage socially. We have to think about that in something beyond us and our families. Okay, that's really interesting, Matt, because I can imagine a response to that being uh, one of the things that I need to do is to really help my child become a good thinker and a participant in this uh, important moment in history. And uh, that would be my primary role, and the secondary would be to speak out and be proactive politically. But I could see someone saying, I'm not necessarily being selfish. I just know that I have to devote a lot of resources to my own children to help them become the kinds of thinkers that could make that change when they are older. Right. Taking the can down the road. Well, I'm not so sure that's true, right? I mean, the the energy and effort involved in helping a child become self-directed and independent thinker and really capable of um, complex, thoughtful dialogue uh, in the midst of also doing all the other things that we do in life isn't necessarily me, I'm making this argument, isn't necessarily me kicking the can down the road. It may be saying the most important thing I can do is to prepare my kids to actually be a good influence in the world they're inheriting. Right. And I think there's there's some truth to that. But that but, what, but, what, but wouldn't your kids say the same thing? I don't know. And, I, and I'm, making, I'm playing the devil's advocate here because yeah. a, another part of me would respond, okay, the way for my kids to see that is for, for them to see me being sort of thoughtfully participating in conversations of, of significance and importance right now that could make it even, uh, that could even change that world radically for them if I don't participate. If I don't stand up and say, hey, I'm uncomfortable with the government legally being able to use propaganda on its own citizens, then I've abdicated the the modeling that I would want to do. Yeah, let me let me let me just add something here just a little bit for you. So I got two biological daughters who are 17 and 22 now, um, and I got a whole bunch of kids that we've adopted here. But let me just speak about my two biological daughters for now. The other kids have kind of followed the same path. Um, so I live in East Vancouver, um, 
and, uh, and we sort of two thirds, three quarters unschooled them. I guess all we unschooled them, but they they stayed home most of the time. Um, I went to a democratic school some of the time here called Windsor House, which both me and my partner worked at. Um, and uh, and both my daughters decided to go to high school when they were uh, right in grade eight. Um, the first one sort of against my against my wishes, honestly. Um, and the second one, I, I kind of learned my lesson. I was like, oh, yeah, great. If you want to go to high school, I'll totally support you. I think it was great. It was fine. I think they both had my, my little ones in grade 12. I should about to start grade 12 now. I think it's great. They've had a great time. Um, and part of the reason I feel so comfortable is that, is that I know that they can drop out at any time they want. Um, any single class they don't want to go to, um, anytime they feel like dropping out of school, they know I got their backs. Um, and that would be totally fine by me. So. So I don't. I feel good about them going to high school, in part because they both seem so happy about it. Um, but for me, one of the most interesting things about it is that my my youngest kid, for she's going to high school, this will be her fifth year coming up. Um, it's just a big public high school down the street, um, and she is uh, one of. There's only one other white kid in her class. Um, there's just kids from primarily from all over Asia, from, from India, from South Asia, from all across Southeast Asia, from China, from Hong Kong. And it's fantastic. It's that's that's one of the great things about it. And I'm so glad for it in so many ways. Um, and that certainly wasn't the case uh, when we were on school or even Democratic. I come to us. Even a, a, a free, publicly available Democratic school like comes to us is that most people that we hung out with, people that we knew in the neighborhood who didn't send their kids to school, people go to Democratic schools, tend to be people who kind of think like us. Um, that people who hold the similar kinds of values, similar kinds of ideas, because of course, um, if you have the opportunity, you, know, you tend to want to hang out with people who are like you, um, people who are fun to hang around with, who are easy to hang around with, and same for kids. Uh, and being thrown in a milieu of a big high school with people who not just don't look like she does, but don't think like her, don't believe like she does, have very different values, it's just been so unbelievably important in my life, um, and so valuable. Um, and so, and just that experience uh, comes, forces all of us to encounter new ideas in so many ways that we just wouldn't have otherwise. That we just wouldn't have. And just having so many different kids in, this, you know, in the house and kids from, from all kinds of different immigrant backgrounds in our, in our house and meeting their families just forces us out of the ways that we were so comfortable thinking. Um, so that's just, that's just one notion. Um, but let me give you another just example of that as well. Which is that in just the sheer number of uh, independent alternative schools I visited over the last decade and a half, and so many just great people, so many wonderful people, kind, thoughtful, interesting, progressive, uh, generous people that I visited who have started all these fantastic schools. And I, like I said, I spent a decade when I was writing and lecturing a lot about education, traveling around North America, uh, giving talks to, to small groups of people and to, and they're talking to schools and talking to parents and talking to teachers and talking to kids. So many cool places I went to. And so many of these great little schools, um, you know, were essentially uh, forced to charge five, six, seven hundred dollars a month tuition because how else were they going to get by? There's no other, there's, you know, that's the only way. And then they were, in almost to a person, they were, they were thoughtful and interesting about it. But these schools ended up being relatively exclusive schools for relatively exclusive folks and dominantly for, for middle class white kids. Um, and and I think that's been what you, you so maybe inadvertently, um, maybe just due to circumstance, but that ends up being a concretization of privilege. That is to say privilege doesn't get challenged, it gets stabilized because you have again a a large number of good, nice, relatively middle class, relatively white, relatively privileged kids getting a good deal again. And kids who are stuck, kids who don't have those opportunities, uh, largely kids from communities of color or marginalized kids of all kinds, just end up getting getting pushed to the margin. And and the homeschooling movement to, to my to my experience, and maybe I maybe I'm not maybe I'm not experienced enough and that's it and may well be the case. But really hasn't taken that on. Hasn't taken on the concretization of racialized privilege sincerely enough. Um, and to say, well, this is in our hearts and our minds. We know this is a good thing, but how is this? How is this not undermining the kind of privilege that is already naming our countries? 
So is the answer that it's a, it, it has to be a willingness to forego a kind of traditional measures of um, stability and success in order to accomplish this as a volunteer movement? I think I think part of it is, is that the answer is that there's no answer. Um, that that's a law, it's an ongoing and complicated question, you know, series of questions. Um, but we have to, I think, have the strength and the willingness to ask ourselves really hard questions. Um, just as I, we've been, and for all the unschoolers and homeschoolers out there, um, and alternative schoolers too, have been asking, you know, really hard questions about what constitutes education, what constitutes learning, how how are my kids thrive, and, and it's a complicated thing that takes. I really do mean it. Does take a lot of courage for all those good, thoughtful, caring homeschooling parents that have had to take. You know, take you know, confront their their parents or their grandparents or their neighbors about why are you not sending your kids to school? That takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of faith and it takes a lot of work. And it's it's the because you, because it's something that you really believe deeply in your heart and something that you if you believe not just theoretically but experientially that we've that we encounter the need to act differently, um, maybe largely based on on our on our love and our care for our children. Um, but then to say, okay, let's move that. Let's, let, I think we need to take that, you know, ask those questions one step further. Uh, and the way that the, this kind of school resisting movement has been able to ask really fundamental, sort of ontological questions, even like, what are we, like, what is this? What is this thing that we are here? What are we trying to do here? And ask those largely, and then ask those about ourselves as well. What, what is exactly the result of this? Sure, that I don't have to send my kid to the ugly little, you know, school down the street. But what does that mean? What are the larger implications of what we're of what we're trying to accomplish here? Um, and is it just that I'm hoping my kid will get to a good college and be smart and not have to suffer and you know, uh, you know, a jerk of a teacher? Or is it, you know, what, like, what exactly is this about here? Is it just about individual flourishing? Is it just about you know liberty? Or is it something more than that? So I'm having this vision in my mind, Matt. I don't know if you're familiar with the open wireless projects, right? But this idea that someone would put up a router in their local neighborhood and it would provide wireless. I'm imagining kind of an open homeschool network in which you say, okay, okay, we'll, you know, we'll all share the burden of taking any comers. So and we'll seek out people who would maybe not have the time or means or resources to participate and kind of expand in a volunteer way. Um, providing some experiences. Yep, I think that's. I mean, I think there's all kinds of ways to think about this. There's all kinds of ways to think about what that means. And I think, in larger respect, the the challenge is to is to really take it on as an act of personal reflection, um, and to be willing to ask ourselves those hard questions. Which is, and, and that's not the easiest, right? That's not the easiest in lots of ways. And for, um, and. It involves not just us, it involves our children, it involves our families, it involves our partners in all kinds of ways. But to ask what are what are our goals here? And that is it and I think that the that the homeschooling movement, parts of it anyways, and if they know it's a big and broad and diverse movement, all kinds of different people from all kinds of different directions, um, need to be able to ask those questions. And and I and I sat one time in Sacramento, I was a, a keynote at a homeschooling conference in Sacramento. And a woman came up to me in all with a, a, a shred of irony uh, and, and said that you know the reason she pulled her kid out of school is because there were too many Mexicans in, in class and she didn't want her um, she didn't want her daughter and her daughter's education being being diluted that way. And I honestly I, I didn't know what to say. Um, I, I think I probably mumbled something inarticulate and just kind of tried to get out of the situation. Um, but in large respect, that is that is the motivation behind so much of the homeschooling movement. Not particularly racialized that way, but you know, there's ugliness, but there's there's all kinds of things. I just don't want my kids to have to deal with, so let's get out of there. Let's get out of there. Um, and I'm I'm not comfortable enough with that. Um, I'm just not. Um, that you know, that getting out while it gets good. I don't think is. I, I think that we can we can demand more of ourselves. Um, and I think there's something like, yeah, like saying, okay, well, why is this thing, you know, that my kid doesn't have to go to school, why is that only available to my kid? Can I expand that? I think that's like a lovely idea. 
Um, and people talk about this, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this in all kinds of ways, probably much more so than I am. But I, I, I run into so many great homeschooling collectives, places where people recognize that, you know, their neighbor's kids aren't happy either and say, well, you know what, like, but if, if we just get five five parents or, you know, or five families, they're willing to take one day a week, we can actually take on, we can actually take on seven kids. We can actually take on, take on eight kids. And if each family is willing to do just one day a week, you can take on seven kids for one day a week. That means that, you know, one family can homeschool five days a week, uh, even if they don't have any capacity to, to support them, support that themselves. Um, there's all kinds of ways to think about it, and I, 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 I hesitate to think that there are particular kinds of answers, because I think that is exactly the folly of, of compulsory schooling. I think that those answers have to be have to be localized answers. I think they have to be conversations between between people, their kids, their neighbors, and their and their and their, uh, their larger you know community about about and asking that question, but not just about what will it take for these kids to thrive. I think that's the starting point, but then asking what will it take for for my neighbors' kids to thrive. What does that mean for my neighborhood? I feel like you and I are having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. <laughs> if there's anybody in the audience that would like to add to the conversation or or um, post in the chat. Matt, I, I've been sort of reading some history, and I'm very intrigued by two periods of time that felt like they, they were latent opportunities for a, a much more significant democracy. The early 1900s in muckraking journalism, and then the 1960s. And in both cases, there was a very overt and um, um, and not hidden uh, response by the elite institutions to clamp down and reduce democracy again. So now we're in a period of time where the internet has really produced opportunities again for dialogue and democratization. Uh, is this different than the early 1900s or the 60s, or can we expect that we're likely to find um, a, a lot of significant pushback against these forces of democracy? Yeah, you know, when you say things, when I, when I hear things like that about the democratizing potential of the Internet, I believe it intellectually, but in my, in my personal experience, I struggle with it. Um, I, I see the capacity for networking, and I see the capacity, you know, the, the unbelievable power of digital communication. Obviously, like in this circumstance, but I'm not convinced that it adds to to democratic possibilities. Frankly, um, I think technological solutions to, to social uh, social conundrums are problematic. I think just as much as, as the internet has provided capacity for 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 communication and for connection for people and for all kinds of networking possibilities. It's also, I think, added to the capacity for state surveillance, for suppression, and for control, uh, you know, equally so. Um, so while I'm, I'm happy to use the Internet to talk to people, to look at my camera and talk to people, well, I think it's, there's certainly all kinds of interesting well, revolutionary possibilities in all kinds of ways. I think that the nature of participation, I think, has not fundamentally changed in a lot of ways. Definitely, people can participate in new places and new ways, and people from, from distance. But I think those notions of participation about what it means to actually live in a democratic culture, um, a place where people actually feel capable of self-determining their lives, I, I'm not convinced the internet is going to set us free per se. Um, nor do I particularly have a lot of faith in. Um, uh, well, let me say this and say this way: is that is that lots of times people will argue in my kind of kind of world, people argue uh, a kind of catastrophism, that, that, you know, that ecological catastrophe is going to force people to start thinking more locally to people that re-examine their lifestyles, that uh, in the wake of, of climate change, in the wake of uh, ecological threat, people are going to have to really reconsider their lifestyles and, and, and how they perceive uh, their consumptive status and how they perceive their productive habits. Um, and I'm not sure that's the case either. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of at a loss to think that there that, we, that it's going to take a, a, a gigantic ongoing climate catastrophe for people to change their their fossil fuel consumption habits. But maybe that's the case. But maybe that I don't welcome it, and nor do I think it's a particularly attractive possibility. But I think the idea, um, the 
the idea of what causes people to participate in their lives in a more meaningful way uh, is a really interesting question. In an educated sense, so many people that I've met, so many homeschool networks, so many alternative schools have been created uh, out of nothing simply because somebody's kid came home crying. Um, somebody's, somebody just couldn't bear the thought of sending their kid to that school, you know, that school down the road, so they started their own. Uh, they, they just couldn't bear the thought of, of, of sending their kid to a, to, a, to a sterile institution for, uh, for eight hours a day, five days a week, you know, ten, hours, ten months a year, um, and miss their children growing up. And they say, well, let's, let's try to do something else. So just sheer kind of emotional exigency uh, drives people to, to, to try something new. Um, oftentimes, it's, it's a health care that, that causes people to change their lifestyles. Um, so it seems evident that, that in the face of disaster, in the face of catastrophe, in the, in the face of the challenges, what causes people to, to rethink the basic you know, presuppositions of their lives. And maybe that is the case. Maybe that when I imagine a, uh, uh, an ecological democracy, a time and a place where people uh, can really take responsibility for their neighborhoods in a really meaningful participatory way, um, maybe it is going to take a catastrophe to make that happen. Um, I'd like to think otherwise. So Marie says, I think it's great to want to expand homeschooling to other kids, but think that hurdle is huge. Why would someone put their trust in me to educate their kids versus the almighty school? Yes, I see this. I'm not very good at multitasking. You know, I always see my, uh, funny, you know, I see my kid, you know, she's working on her, working on her homework. She's on Facebook at the same time. She's listening to music, you know, I'm like, hey, just, just do one thing at a time. And she looked at me like a nut, you know. I look at this thing and I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay, he's like, I got, I got to read this. I got to read this thing and then I got to answer it. I went to the video and there's only all of a sudden I realized how old I am. Um, I think that's a good question. But then, but why? But, but who are you? Like, why would someone put their trust in me? Well, when you send your kid to school, all you're doing is putting your trust in some random teacher. You know what I mean? Um, why not? Um, I think that's a that's a question for all of me. Why would you put your trust in you to keep your kid at home instead of sending your kid to school? Or why would you put your trust? Why would you put your trust in you um, to contribute to starting an alternative school or to starting? You know what I mean? Like, why would anybody put uh, you know any of our trust in anybody else in any of our neighbors? And I think that's part of our um, our challenge here is to, is to begin to think beyond notions of experts and professionals. To think through this idea that actually everyday people, like ourselves, are actually very capable of sophisticated thinking about what our children need. Uh, but similarly, are very capable of sophisticated economic thinking. They're really, that there's, when we talk about economics, we're talking about a very simple set of questions. We're asking, how do we count what matters? Uh, what, what matters to us and how are we going to calculate it? Um, and that's not dissimilar to talking about uh, about our kids. They're not those are they're, they're not scientific rational answers about how to how to formulate a, the best you know education system. They're, they're simple questions about oh, what are the conditions under which my kids are going to thrive, and how can I make them happen? Um, and I think that I think simply asking those kind of questions, asking really fundamental questions, and resisting the urge to um, Resisting the urge to default to professionals and the professional treatment, I think, is a challenge for all of us. Let's check it out here. I got another. I got another comment. Got two here. more comments. Hang on, hold on. I'm going to have to leave in about a minute because we've got the Kevin Soling coming on to talk about war on kids. Uh, so if you don't mind answering those fairly quickly, then I we can close up and move on. <laughs> That's very delicately put, Steve. I like it. Um, the teen trip, someone like having others put their children. Yeah, but just that's no, I mean, it's not really any different than you taking the neighbor's kids to the beach for the day. I just end up having to take, you know, 28 kids for a month. Um, and I try not to teach kids. I think that, that, I think there's a reciprocal relationship between teaching and learning. I think the less teaching there is, the more learning is, is possible. That's another matter for another day. I just like traveling with kids. I think it's the funnest thing I used to do when I was a teenager. Um, and we used, to have a, we used to have a great time traveling with a bunch of teenagers. We, we take off. Last time we were in Utah for 30 days, just drive, driving around and 
Gapping together. All right, good to point. Matt, <laughs> okay. there's such a good conversation here. I do have to close us. Did you want to respond to the JSTOP comment? Uh, no, no, it's too good. That's a great, that's a great comment, JSTOP, and I, um, I'm going to leave it to you because I think it's, a, I think it's an awesome comment. And there's too much for me to answer there. Okay, it's hard right, to find yeah. the applause button here, but I'm, I'm clicking on the smiley face, and I go down to applause. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for overcoming the technical challenges. Thanks for making yourself available. Thanks, thanks for being willing to tackle the tough questions. Thanks for having me. Take care, y'all. Thank you.